Welcome to the uh, first Biographer Circle meeting of 2021. Uh, two years ago, Gayford Steinberg and Michael Schneerson very generously teamed up with Deirdre David, who you see here, and Kitty Kelly uh, and I uh, to, to provide, create the Biographer's Circle, which offers support for research and writing and for biographers. And uh, we, two years ago, we had uh, Robert Caro and then Stacy Shift in our first year, which included cocktails and a wonderful uh, dinner at uh, the townhouse of uh, Michael and, and Gayford. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we, we've been on Zoom this year, but we've done very well with that. We had Jonathan Alter, who uh, in, the, in the fall spoke about his uh, uh, Plutarch nominated biography of Jonathan Carter. Uh, and uh, this, this coming September, and we're crossing our fingers and hoping it will be in person, uh, we're going to have um, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner Debbie Applegate speaking about her long awaited biography of called Madam, the life, uh, the biography of Polly Adler, who was one of the great, the great Madam of the 20. 20th century, and it's a perfect book to follow up on her um, biography of a preacher. Uh, th this evening, we're delighted to have uh, Peniel Joseph and Ed Pavlik, I can't pronounce it, but Pavlik. <laughs> Pavlik, Pavlik, uh, speaking about uh, Peniel's wonderful new biography, uh, The Sword and the Shield, The Rever Revolutionary Lives of, Martin, of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Uh, a recent review said it is elegantly rendered and a powerful dual biography. And in order to introduce them, I want to introduce Deidre David, the former vice president of BIO, uh, a member of the board, and one of the founding founders of the Biographer Circle, and who's done a tremendous amount. And, and Deidre, take it away. I'm happy to do so. Um, I'm very happy. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening for what promises to be a stimulating and I think a lively discussion. Peniel Joseph is the Barbara Jordan Chair in Political Values and Ethics at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and a professor in the History Department at the University of Texas at Austin. Before going to UT in 2015, Professor Joseph taught at Tufts University where he founded the Center for the study of race and democracy. At UT, he's established the second center for the study of race and democracy, and he is, of course, the director. His primary intellectual focus uh, to date uh, has been on black power studies, an interdisciplinary field, I think, that encompasses Africana studies, law and society, women's and ethnic studies and political science. Among his many, many publications are Waiting Till the Midnight Hour, A Narrative History of Black Power in America, and Stokely, A Life, termed by many critics the definitive biography of Stokely Carmichael. This evening he will be discussing his most recent book, as Will have course, has already said, The Sword and the Shield, with Ed Pavlich. And now I am very pleased to introduce Ed. Uh, Ed Pavlich is Distinguished Research Professor of English and African American Studies at the University of Georgia. His many published books range across several intersecting genres, poetry, nonfiction, critical studies, the novel, literary criticism. Centered in African-American life and culture, much of his work explores racial dynamics in the experience of individuals. Let It Be Broke, which was published last year, is a collection of poems focusing upon race and contemporary life. Who Can Afford to Improvise, and I love this title, James Baldwin and Black Music, the Lyric and the Listeners, came out in 2016. And forthcoming, we have No Time to Rest. This is another great title, I think. No Time to Rest, James Baldwin's Life in Letters to His Brother David, 
what a wonderful idea to do this, a retelling of Baldwin's life and career based upon 33 years of letters he wrote to his youngest brother. This summer, the University of Minnesota Press will publish Professor Pavlich's latest book, Outward, Adrian Rich's Expanding Studies, a study of her life and career. So welcome Peniel and Ed to this virtual meeting of the Biographer's Circle. It's a great pleasure to have you here. So, Thank you. go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Michael, Will, and Deidre, thank you all uh, for the invitation for curating this group. And, and of course, above all, thanks to Peniel for, for the work that brings us all here. And um, I mean, thanks on behalf of us all to Peniel for bringing us all here. Personally, uh, just to start out by thanking Peniel for, I don't know how long, we must have met almost 10 years ago now, about, yeah. nine, about nine years ago, and uh, just such a a great sense of accompaniment I've had uh, from Peniel intellectually, personally, ever since we met. Um, and, and most of all, you know, thanks for the books, man. <laughs> uh, I, keep, I keep them here right behind me all the time. I'm looking up stuff in them all the time and uh, was really thrilled when I got the advanced uh, edition of The Sword and the Shield. So really thrilled and, and, and look forward and excited to uh, talk to you about the book. Yeah, no, thanks, Ed, for, for being the interlocutor here. I've always admired your work. We met at Harvard. We were, we were fellows at Harvard writing uh, respective books. For me, it was uh, trying to finish uh, the Stokely book uh, in 2012, which was, which was a 10-year journey. And uh, uh, I can't remember what specific work you were doing there because you've had so many, yeah. so many books. <laughs> yeah, I, I was writing a book on, on Baldwin's life as told. Oh, Baldwin, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, you're part of the Renaissance in terms of uh, James Baldwin's uh, work, your work, Eddie Gloud, but you've been one of the early uh, reappreciators of, of yep. Baldwin. Raoul Peck, I am not your Negro. We're, we're finally paying attention to Baldwin and his, his, his real genius uh, in our own time after he fell out of favor for decades in the context of Reaganism and, and, and yes. Et cetera, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, um, you know, and, and I think maybe Baldwin might come up in the course of our conversation yeah, because of absolutely. course we have relationships with both of our subjects here. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how to approach this exactly. Uh, maybe start big, get small, and then go back out big. So, you know, it strikes me, Pedio, and, you know, le leading up to meeting you here and meeting everybody here <clears throat> and all that's been going on the last week, the last year uh, in a country, I think a lot about <clears throat> the space left during our lifetimes mm -hmm. by the by the murder of these two of these two yeah. men, <clears throat> and um, you know, who knows? They'd still be alive. They'd be ninety something now, but but mm -hmm. they would have been alive for for most of our lifetimes, at least. Yeah. But they weren't. You know, I was born in sixty six. You must have been born a couple years after that, probably right? Sixty seven, yeah. eight, seventy two, actually. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So you know. So we, we lived our lives in this country without these with the yeah. men, you know, subsequent to their murder. So I'm wondering if you can talk from the perspective of all your work, really, but certainly from um, the perspective this book gives us about just, you know, it's a vast, vast question, it's conjecture, but, but how do you think about and imagine the space left by, the, by these, you know, twin, these twin murders? Of this yeah, you know. No, that's a great start, Ed. I think, you know, one, we have people like Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte who are 94, right. right? So I just want us to think, well, sometimes people say, well, will they have been alive? Dr. King was born in 1929. Uh, Malcolm X was born in 1925 as Malcolm Little. But just to show you two examples of longevity, and I could show people many more, just sort of the wonderful actors and icons, Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte, who are really... Um, analogs to Malcolm and Martin in a lot of different ways. Uh, they're both alive and they're 94 years old. They were both born in February, March of 1927, respectively. So I, you know, I think I think that the deaths of of Malcolm and Martin um, continue to haunt and shape our time, right? Uh, I think that their political thought and activism, however, really reverberates. I would probably say uh, more strongly in our time 
uh, I would dare say than actually in theirs. Because uh, one thing, I'm, my, my uh, this book, the paperback is coming out on, on my birthday, actually on October 5th. And they've let me do a new preface and do different things. And one of the things I say, I, I look at what, one, the, the, the fact that the book came out in 2020, right before George Floyd's uh, murder and, and the protests. But I look at the fact that there are certain things that are happening when it comes to structural racism, systemic racism in the United States that King and Malcolm would not be surprised by. But there are other things that they would have been surprised by. And one of them was the depth of the protests last year when they were alive. And remember, they were alive during the Cuban revolution. They were alive during the Second World War. They were alive during the Cold War at its height. The United, in the United States, there was never 15 to 26 million people, including in many cities that were 95% white, who came out and demonstrated for racial justice, right? And so when, when you think about the issues that they talk about, for King, I, I, you know, I, I make the argument, it's this, this notion of radical Black citizenship. For Malcolm, radical Black dignity. Um, we, we've come out uh, in the United States um, not just debating, but in support of those concepts in, in a bigger, more tangible way, in a bigger, more multiracial, multigenerational way than ever in the history of the Republic. So they would be, I think, heartened by that, right? Um, we're seeing the, the, the disconnect between sort of mass social movements uh, and, and the alacrity with which you can pass policy. Right, because so and and in their time that 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 happened too. You had the march on Washington, which at the time was the biggest civil rights demonstration in history, two hundred fifty thousand, um, and you really don't get uh, legislation passed until uh, the Civil Rights Act. But the Voting Rights Act, which is so key, doesn't pass until two years later. Right, so there's a lag time. So when you're thinking people talking about a George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Even though I know some people feel it doesn't go far enough, um, it still has yet to be passed. So one of the things that we've seen in American history is that social movements, whether it's women's suffrage, whether it's um, labor movements uh, for nine to five and benefits, uh, whether it's movements for immigration rights or disability rights, we think about things that were passed in 73, but it took so long to get the ADA passed. You have people demonstrating and out in the streets um, and there's a lag time between, between policy. Uh, so I, I would say that what's extraordinary about the issues that Malcolm and Martin were talking about, these issues of, of dignity and citizenship, and we can break those down, yeah. is that in our own time, um, if any of us thought, uh, I remember when Hurricane Katrina happened, that was a big moment, uh, especially for Black people, but just for sort of a reckoning on race. Uh, when Barack Obama uh, became president. That was a big moment uh, when we think about race. Um, but really the last 18 months, um, you think about BLM 1.0 in 2013, uh, you think about Tea Partiers and sort of racial backlash. We think about the rise of Trump and sort of Trumpism. So it's not just one person, but this philosophy, right? That goes way back to reconstruction and the Confederacy and white supremacy and the slave power, right? And so I think what's so extraordinary, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a book right now on America's third reconstruction. And so I've had to reread W.E.B. Du Bois. I had to reread. And Du Bois talks about this phrase that it's really stuck in my mind and, I, and it connects with Malcolm and Martin. Um, abolition democracy is what Du Bois called it. He called it abolition democracy. And it's a book, it's a phrase that I keep using in this book uh, because the way in which he defines abolition democracy is very similar to how Malcolm X talked about uh, black dignity and Martin Luther King Jr. talked about citizenship. Um, abolition democracy was trying to get um, to the universal through the particular struggle of black people, how black people tried to save democracy by ending not just racial slavery, but ending the slave power that was connected to racial slavery. Du Bois saw slavery as a manifestation of this kind of grotesque authoritarian, anti-democratic, white supremacist regime, right? He thought they went hand in hand yeah. and that you couldn't destroy slavery without destroying that regime that had undergirded it or slavery was gonna be 
resuming its form under a different guise, right? And so from that perspective, this idea of the new Jim Crow and the caste system, Malcolm and Martin really get at that as well. And so this idea of abolition democracy in our own time, this time period of, of, of uh, where we're at now is really, really interesting and important. And I do think that Malcolm and Martin's legacies really resonate uh, now uh, more than ever in our own time. Yeah, no doubt. That's interesting you, you say uh, abolition democracy. And I think of just, I think of the kind of abolitionist consciousness or at least elements of the abolitionist consciousness and how current they seem now, you know, the, the, the old um, abolitionist credo, uh, no comp was it no union, no compromise with slavery, no union with slaveholders? Yes. Yeah, and, and um, how that kind of uncompromising radical stance can resonate politically in, in, in widely ranging ways. Uh, very interesting. So yeah, I, I, I also, um, <clears throat> interesting how you, how you went from place to place in, in terms of imagining uh, the space left by the absence of these two men. You know, it's not to say that their work is absent through our lifetimes, through the period of history from, you know, through the 70s till now, because it certainly is in all kinds of ways. But what I was kind of getting at was, or I was, I wondered if you'd have um, a way of thinking about this is what, what the loss of their presence has meant, which means how do we imagine how they would have made their way through based on, you know, the trajectory they were in when, when, they, when they were gone, um, when they left, when they were murdered. Um, you, you know, I think that both rapid transition at the time, you know, very, very radical transitions for both of them within the last year of their lives. Yeah, I think if their presence, you know, I think it's interesting because I think on one hand, the kind of you know this, right? It's impossible to know, but it's interesting to, to hear a, a person who's really lived with this as a scholar, just imagine it. Yeah, you know, Ed, I think that they, they would have been interesting because they would have had to reinvent themselves the way in which all long-term activists and organizers reinvent themselves. I think for King, um, King was pushing towards this overall um, you know, a peace movement and this idea of creating a beloved community that was free of systemic racism, free of economic injustice, but that required the redistribution of wealth. So I think that um, when King talked about militarism, materialism, and racism as the triple evils facing America and the world, King really pushes back against the idea that only Black demonstrators have to be nonviolent. He argues that the United States also has to be nonviolent. Law enforcement has to be nonviolent with citizens. Uh, he argues that uh, we shouldn't be engaged in imperial war wars like Vietnam, right? So he was holding us to a higher moral standard. And he says that he said that we needed to have a revolution of values, right? Um, I think as that translates into the 1970s, uh, so for a minute, minute before uh, the 1980s, I think that King's presence might have been an actual anecdote uh, to um, what sometimes people call the rise of a conservative revolution or backlash that is undergirded by um, the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, right? So I think that when you think about King, uh, him being into the 70s, for a moment, don't put him into the 21st century, just another decade, right? Um, the, the moral force and power King had uh, when he talked about building that beloved community. And King was able to really talk to black power revolutionaries. He was very friendly with Stokely Carmichael. Um, the Black Panthers respected King, even as some people criticized him, right? Uh, King was uh, leading a poor people's campaign, which is really America's first Occupy movement. It's not the Occupy Wall Street movement. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was bringing poor whites from Appalachia and West Virginia. He was bringing indigenous folks and native peoples. He was bringing in Mexican Americans. And you know, what's interesting is, and I write this in the book, he's meeting with these leaders, welfare mothers, he's meeting with them. Like he's, it's like you enter a room and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is meeting with you and he's listening, he's listening. And he's saying, he's saying, you know what? I listen, I'm listening to you and what you've all done to me is change and transform me. I've become the student and you're my teacher. And that's why Dr. King is like, we need a universal basic income. And he says, not for me, for all these people right behind me, right? And Dr. King is the person who's saying, I'm not gonna come to Washington with a gun 
a knife or a curse word. And everybody says he's going to cause violence in Washington. Can you believe it? <laughs> I mean, this is somebody who's had bricks thrown at him, who's had people shove him, punch him in the face, arrested dozens of times. And they're saying he's going to produce violence in Washington, D.C., right? So he's an extraordinary figure. But one thing I argue in the book, too, is that you see through King's radicalization, which I argue Malcolm is pivotal for, the muscularity of, of nonviolence. Nonviolence is a coercive movement. Uh, King is not a coward and he's not a saint. King is a revolutionary political activist whose tool is nonviolence. So he's saying we all have to change, all of us, rich, poor, black, white, everything in between. He's just saying we shouldn't have to change violently, but he's still putting pressure on all of us, right? He's putting pressure on all of us to change. So that's a scary thing. That's why when white folks in the South and in the North say that Dr. King is a subversive, Dr. King is dangerous, they're right. He is dangerous for the status quo. Now, I'm not agreeing with the reasoning that is behind their criticism. He's not a communist. He does not hate the United States of America. He, in fact, loves the country. He loves all people, you know. Um, but he is dangerous to the status quo. He absolutely is dangerous. So I think that's what he would have done. I think in terms of Malcolm, it's an interesting counterfactual in this sense. Malcolm is talking about human rights uh, he's, he's making the argument that, that, that white people um, have a role to play, that he met white Muslims, uh, you know, on the Hajj uh, in the Middle East. Um, you know, Malcolm wants to be part of this uh, global Islamic community that is secular at the same time. Malcolm's the person who's trying to, uh, really following black radicals of the 1940s, trying to charge the United States with genocide, charged the United States with human rights violations against Black people at the United Nations, right? Malcolm X, which I talk about in the book, uh, most people don't know, had um, offices at the United Nations. He had access to diplomatic offices and credentials uh, for, for many, many years because he had met with African and third world leaders in Harlem who said, you, my friend, can come to the United Nations anytime you want and you can use our offices. And he did, what did he do? He said, okay, thank you. And he would, everybody who was at the UN in New York knew Malcolm X. He, could, he would stroll in there and it's Malcolm who introduces those folks to Cassius Clay before Cassius Clay becomes Muhammad Ali. Yeah. So Malcolm is his mentor for over two years, right? So I think Malcolm's presence into the 1970s would have been very, very interesting in the sense that we think about the rise of mass incarceration. We think about the rise of the carceral state. We think about um, the fact that the war on poverty becomes the war on crime. And we go from the Great Society to the Safe Streets Act of 1968 that starts the federal government in the business of giving billions of dollars in grants so we have 150,000 police officers in 1970, and we have over 800,000 now. And it's important for us to remember that the police have been used as a management system instead of solving the problems uh, of, of racial injustice and systemic racism and economic inequality, right? So when we think about the urban rebellions of the 1960s, uh, those were just symptomatic of a larger problem. And the Kerner Commission said this, right? The Kerner Commission in 1968 is a bestseller. Uh, it, it's going to say that we need large systemic changes in the United States in policing and criminal justice, but in healthcare, uh, in public schools. We need to desegregate. We need full employment. We need all these different things, right? And so I think Malcolm would have been key, his presence in pushing back against the criminalization um, of, of black bodies. Because what, there, there's a new book uh, uh, by Elizabeth Hinton, uh, extraordinary book, uh, America on Fire, that's coming out in May that really looks at this history. And, and uh, what's so extraordinary is that we think of the urban rebellions as having taken place from 64 to 68. They continue into the first half of the 1970s. And most of them are taking place in 
uh, small and mid-sized cities. So they're taking place in York, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, New Bern, uh, North Carolina. They're taking place in um, Hoboken, New Jersey, right? And, and it's all connected to policing, over the over-policing of Black communities, the over-policing of schools that are being racially integrated, the over-policing of housing projects and playgrounds starts in the 1970s. And certainly we take it on steroids into the 80s and 90s and the present, right? So I think both of them would have served a different but overlapping roles. Yeah, yeah clearly different, but definitely connected. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, I think uh, Cairo, Illinois was another one of those small town, big riots and that town never- Cairo, Cairo. Yeah, Cairo, K Cairo, Cairo, Illinois, with Dr. Charles Cohen, Reverend, Reverend, Reverend Cohen. Yeah, yeah. and and um, Elizabeth Hinton's book really gets into that too. Yeah, yeah. Cairo, yeah. Illinois. Yeah. So switching gears, let, let's talk a little bit about um, each of these men's uh, upbringing, because <laughs> it's so interesting how they come from very different trajectories. And I'm, I'm, you know, in upbringing, I mean, childhood, but also young adulthood, kind of on the road to becoming the people that we begin to recognize in history. And I, I had in mind, um, if you could talk a little bit about whatever comes to mind that's distinctive for you and interesting to bring up, but, but in going through the book and thinking about things with other sources, I, I'm thinking about the importance of Garvey to Malcolm's family. Yeah. Um, and, all, and then, you know, to him, mm -hmm. and, and not only just to his family, but also to, to the family in Boston, you know, that, that he mm -hmm. comes up in that way. And also, um, I'm interested in, in what you had to say about King's, what I see as King's kind of intellectual radicalization at Crozier in, in Chester, Pennsylvania, with, with his introduction to uh, liberation theology. You know, also interesting, I don't know, do you note this in the book that it's, is it, it's really interesting that um, King goes to his first graduate school in Chester, Pennsylvania, which is the hometown of Baird Rushton. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. interesting. I don't think they, they ever ran across each other then because Russian was already gone, but yeah, he was gone. They, had, they had a lot to do with each yeah. other later, which I want to get to before I hope I hope before we before we run out of time. So what about uh, Garvey and Malcolm's family coming up, how that shaped him and then King's interaction with liberation theology as a young intellectual at, the, at his first stop in the seminary? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, definitely, I'll touch on both of those. I think w one thing, a through line that I've found is this great anecdote when I talk about both of them in their childhoods is the movie Gone with the Wind, right? And how Gone with the Wind, <laughs> they both have these incredible, indelible memories of Gone with the Wind. For King, it's um, the, the premiere is in Atlanta in 1939 when King is 10 years old. And King is aghast in the King family uh, because Gone with the Wind is of course a celebration of the lost cause. It's a celebration of the Confederacy. It's a celebration of Really, by um, last summer, you know, uh, hundreds of monuments came down in the context of this 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 sort of revolution that happened in the United States. Ninety five percent of those demonstrations, which were nonviolent, um, uh, King is is aghast at Gone with the Wind, and he remembers the premiere in Atlanta. Malcolm sees the movie. Uh, when he's 14 years old in Mason, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit, uh, of, of Lansing rather. And, and what's so interesting is that Malcolm talks about in his autobiography that he says, when Butterfly McQueen got into her act, I felt like crawling under the rug, right? And Butterfly McQueen, of course, is um, one of Miss Scarlet's um, uh, African-American enslaved women. Right there's there's uh, Hattie McDaniel wins uh, an Oscar for playing uh, uh, you know um, uh, Mammy uh, basically and Butterfly McQueen plays this this enslaved African American uh, teenage girl who uh, in one scene is is memorably um, uh, beaten and slapped in the face by Vivian Lee's Miss Scarlet. So I, I I start with that just to show how both Malcolm and Martin even though they have very, very different social economic class backgrounds and, and, and upbringings are both uh, really indelibly scarred by the racism and the white supremacy, just even culturally, beyond politically and economically, of course that's there, but culturally like that. They, these are two folks, one born in Lansing, Michigan, 
uh, on uh, May 19th, 1925. The other born in Atlanta, Georgia, January 15th, 1929. And both are indelibly scarred by Gone with the Wind as young, young people, right? And seeing those are the images of themselves that they're seeing, right? Now, when we think about Malcolm, you know, Malcolm is, is uh, going to be certainly the poorer of the two. He's the, he's the person who was born Malcolm Little. Uh, he's one of eight children uh, on his mother, his biological mother and father's side. He's one of 11 children uh, in toto when, when you think about his, his, his father. Uh, uh, you know, Malcolm's parents are followers of Marcus Garvey. And when you think about Marcus Garvey, Garvey is just um, the, the, the antecedent to what we think of as black power. So for people who might not know, well, who is Marcus Garvey? Garvey is a Jamaican uh, immigrant who was influenced by both uh, Booker T. Washington's self-help philosophy, but he's also influenced by uh, revolutionary Pan-Africanists, and he's also influenced by Black socialists like the street speaker and organizer Hubert Harrison. So he's a melange of things, you know, when we think about Marcus Garvey. Garvey has conservative ideas, he's yeah. got progressive ideas, he's got uh, radical ideas. He's, he's all of that in one figure. And um, the, the idea that Malcolm's parents take from Garvey is this idea of Black self-determination, that, that they should be able to go anywhere they want in the Midwest, and they go to Milwaukee, they go to, uh, uh, they're in Omaha, Nebraska. He's actually born in Omaha, Nebraska. And, and uh, they become farmers. They move to predominantly white communities. Unlike Dr. King was raised in the, in the upper middle class, segregated south of Atlanta, sweet Auburn Avenue. Malcolm was raised in predominantly white areas. You know, his, his parents moved to places where there was better infrastructure and there were better uh, 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 educational contexts and just better places for their children. They faced a lot of racism and discrimination, but until his father is killed when he's six years old, uh, Malcolm has a, a, a pretty good um, upbringing. His father is going to be um, killed by what we now know when we think about um, uh, the, the, the Dead Are Rising uh, a biography of Malcolm X, um, that his family felt that it was a streetcar accident. His older brother felt that way. Malcolm always felt it was white supremacist because the family had been harassed by the Klan all throughout the Midwest, yeah. both the Klan and just other white supremacist groups because they were always the black family in a house, in a residence, going to a school they weren't supposed to. So it's important to understand that about Malcolm X. Then we think about the trauma of his father's death. His mother is eventually institutionalized. Um, uh, as we know from the, the, the now the dead are arising um, and, 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 and my own scholarship too. I mean, he's, he's a juvenile delinquent uh, between the ages of 12 and 20. Like you said, Ed, he moves to uh, Roxbury to be with his half sister, Ella Mae Collins, who really becomes his closest friend throughout his life. Ella Mae Collins, Malcolm X's older half sister is the person who pays for him to go to uh, the Hodge. She's the one who bails him out of all kinds of trouble. At the same time, she gets him into some trouble because her lifestyle uh, in Boston was one where she was part of the underground economy, right? Uh, Malcolm um, has interracial lovers and girlfriends, which is one of the reasons why when he is caught as uh, part of a burglary ring, he gets uh, an 11-year sentence. Um, and the prosecutor tells him, and the defense attorney tells him, you shouldn't have been with them white girls. They tell him that in 1946. And so they're getting 11 years, not because of what they did, but because of who they associated with, right? Um, so anyway, when we think about what shapes Malcolm, and Malcolm's gonna spend almost 77 months in three different prisons in Massachusetts, um, Malcolm is going to be part of what, what Ralph Ellison calls the lower frequencies. He's gonna exist uh, in the context of the bowels of, 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 of black urban America. He's gonna be punished for um, really trying to defy uh, the strictures of Jim Crow racial segregation. So that's gonna really shape his, 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 his youth uh, in comparison to King. I mean, King um, 
certainly Dr. King faces racism, but King um, goes to Morehouse College at the age of 15. Uh, King writes uh, some great um, um, uh, protest letters, uh, even in 1940s. He famously, Dr. King uh, was Jim Crowed on a bus ride from Atlanta uh, to, for, further to maybe Athens or, or, or further out uh, when he won an oratory contest and he had to stand for the whole two hour ride. And he, he famously said, it's the angriest he's ever been, right? With, with white folks, with white supremacy, with everything. Um, what happens to King though, is that uh, King becomes part of an interracial youth commission in Atlanta. Uh, King obviously is the son of a, of a preacher um, Martin Luther King Sr., Ebenezer Baptist, which is now the, the pulpit of Reverend Raphael Warnock, the first Black senator uh, elected out of the state of Georgia. So we see how this reverberates in our own time. But King becomes somebody who um, doesn't quite uh, experience um, the existential racial crisis that Malcolm experiences, but he's certainly imbibing the social gospel He's certainly being taught by Dr. Benjamin Mays, Howard Thurman. And Dr. Benjamin Mays, I can't, we can't say too much about him. These are folks who are these uh, African-American theologians uh, who, who really are the inventors of the Black social gospel, this idea that when we think about Christianity and the Bible and the Old and New Testament, uh, we should be passionate, uh, service-oriented leaders of, of justice and trying to end racial injustice and economic injustice in the United States and globally. And this is why you had people like Howard Thurman and also Daddy King who traveled to India. They traveled to Germany. They traveled to, 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 to meet and to build with Gandhi, right? Um, they, they, they traveled the world looking for a gospel of equity and really a gospel of abolition democracy. That's what they were looking for, right? And so when we think about this idea of black liberation theology, which springs out of the black social gospel of the 1960s. Certainly Dr. King is a part of that tradition. He's a part of that tradition, even as other, other uh, uh, spokespersons and spokeswomen in that tradition uh, are identified with the black power thrust. So I, I would say that their youth is shaped by both the pain and trauma of Jim Crow America, but their youth is also shaped by the joy uh, and the triumphs that they find both intellectually, politically. Uh, 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 for Malcolm, he finds those triumphs in prison. And one of the things I do in the book is that the years that Malcolm is in prison, Malcolm goes to prison when Dr. King's a sophomore at Morehouse. And Malcolm, Ma Malcolm by the time he's released on parole, uh, August 7th, 1952, Dr. King has just completed his first year of doctoral studies at Boston University. So to imagine that two people who have that experience are going to influence each other later on is just, it, it's flat out, it's a miracle. It's extraordinary. You would not think that somebody who's doing almost seven years in prison while this other person who's going to be a leader is doing an undergraduate degree at Morehouse College, one of the best schools in, in the United States then and now, who gets a theological degree at Crozier Seminary in Chester, Pennsylvania, like you said, the birthplace of Bayard Rustin, one of the most important, uh, you know, democratic leaders in American history, Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin is the organizer of the March on Washington. Bayard West Rustin is the openly uh, queer uh, champion of social justice who uh, goes to jail as a conscientious objector uh, in the Second World War, who travels to India, uh, who becomes somebody who's a practicing uh, organizer in nonviolence and Gandhi in nonviolence, who, who sneaks into Birmingham, who, street, who sneaks into Montgomery, Alabama, uh, in the back of a car trunk, uh, uh, writing for uh, Le Figaro magazine, and becomes a mentor to Martin Luther King Jr. So when we think about Bayard Rustin, he's a peace activist. He's the, he's him and William Worthy and others were part of the Congress of Racial Equality when they did the first Freedom Rides in 1947. Uh, Bayard Rustin, has been jailed both for his sexuality and jailed uh, uh, for being a nonviolent demonstrator and peace activist. So, so Bayard Rustin is somebody who fought for social justice, uh, got his teeth knocked out for social justice, just like C.T. Vivian, uh, and is somebody who's still uh, not um, rightfully recognized as one of the architects 
of, of 20th century American democracy and peace movements. Yeah, no, no, it, it deserves, we, we need to know more about Bayard Rustin for sure. Oh, Bayard Rustin deserves a national holiday. I mean, Sorry. Bayard, Bayard Rustin, it turns out, I mean, we, we, you know, if you, if you want to talk about a, a holiday that says, hey, you know, we're all queer and we should all be proud of it. Uh, by Rustin is the is the is 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 the person you know so yeah and also uh, just one second Deidre wants to uh, break it so probably do I wanted to say that this is uh, your wonderful discussion is generating a lot of questions so uh, yeah. good if we could we get to them are you yeah, ready yeah, I, yeah. I just want to say one thing about Bayard Rustin uh, this great uh, moment that I, I I remember reading about where he's in jail I think in West Virginia in his first federal prison stint is 1942 and he, he was an incredible singer mm -hmm. Russian was it was a like a all-state defensive tackle football player just statuesque incredible figure in a, in, a, in, a, in a man in a person and also with this great singing voice and he he uh, was organizing the prison you know and one of the things he did is he learned that he could basically broadcast his singing voice through the air through the air vents in the system in the thing so he was in there singing strange fruit um to, to the prison population in the prison uh just the, the image of bear rushing this beautiful tenor singing strange fruit in 1942 in a federal prison just incredible you know um and we're so poor not knowing these things about our about our country and our lives and our people so anyway just <laughs> i'm a poet so i work in 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 the I work in particulars, you know, these kind of resonant things, but I, I couldn't resist that. So and please, images too, images, right? I mean, it's extraordinary yeah. image. Such a great um, <clears throat> Well, um, all right, here's the first question. I think um, this is from Debbie Applegate. She asks, <clears throat> as someone who studied generational activism in depth, how would you compare the current outpouring of youth activism to mid 20th century youth activism? Oh yeah, no, I think they're really comparable. I think that now um, we have even more young people uh, out in the streets and demonstrating. So I'd say that, you know, I mean, we, we have data for instance, that when we think about uh, February 1st, 1960 and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the, um, the, the, the lunch counter sit-ins that lead to SNCC, uh, that starts with four African-American students. They're later joined by some white students. By the spring of 1960, there's over 50,000 students involved, right? And when we think about, just to give it some data points on like student activism from the mid 20th century into the 1970s, by 1970, after Kent State, uh, there's 1.2 million students who go on strike. 1.2 million, right? Um, so, you know, there's, there's there's a there's a range, right? I would say with BLM, and I would start with BLM in 2013, um, Debbie, and not not just this this um, this current recent that we we've started to see more uh, student activism and youth activism um, from 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 not just Black students but Latinx students and white students and Asian students. And that has crested over the last nine, nine years. So I would say that what, what, one of the things that has been a driver is um, social media. Another thing that has been a driver is really this long history that's connected to Martin and Malcolm and Bayard Rustin and Audre Lorde and Angela Davis of, of grassroots organizing that continued to persist. So the reason why you can have somebody like Kimberly Crenshaw um, um, come up with a term like intersectionality is that the movements continue to persist and at times activists, scholars, policy experts who had been raised in that movement tried to use their skills uh, in other arenas, right? They use their skills for voting rights, they use their skills against domestic violence for black women, they use their skills for black maternal uh, uh, women's health outcomes and wellness, they use their skills uh, to try to uh, tamp down um, the, the public school to prison uh, pipelines, all these things. So I think when we think about youth activism now, they really stand on the soldiers, the shoulders of not just uh, the icons, but the people who continue to do the work. If we read uh, Beth Ritchie's um, uh, Development Arrested, if we read uh, from Kitchen Table uh, Press, um, uh, you know, all the 
all the all the men are blacks, all the women are white, uh, but some of us are brave, black women's studies. And you read Patricia Bell Scott and Gloria Hull and Barbara Smith uh, and the Combi River Collective. They're the folks um, who, alongside of the works of people like Mumia, Abu Jamal and political prisoners who gave us intersectionality in that sense. It goes back to the 19th century and Mariah Stewart and Frances Harper and Ida B. Wells and, 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 and black women and alongside of people like Frederick Douglass who are doing this. But what's so extraordinary about these young people is that they've wedded uh, King's notion of radical black citizenship. And remember, King said that citizenship was not just the absence of oppression. He said it was the visible appearance of healthcare, decent housing, food justice, um, the end of segregation in public schools and neighborhoods. <clears throat> and King also said, the end of violence and materialism. We were too greedy of a society and we were a perpetually violent society. He's saying this in the late 60s, we've gotten worse, right? And so what's interesting is they've wed that notion of wanting a new kind of citizenship to what Malcolm talked about radical black dignity. What did he mean by that? Malcolm said radical black dignity was not just the political affirmation of black people for self-determination. It was gonna be two things, the recognition of black people's humanity and human rights collectively, but also what Malcolm said, the end of world white supremacy. And we, we have a president who actually used the term white supremacy in an inauguration speech, right? Who said that, look, this is an existential crisis. And so what Malcolm meant by world white supremacy, it wasn't just the Klan. Yes, the Klan is bad. I'm not a pro-Klan person. <laughs> it wasn't just the Klan, but the Klan was not the only people practicing white supremacy, right? He was saying the whole thing, the whole kit and caboodle, we have to imagine ourselves in a different way, in a way that we think about human rights for all people, but what King and Malcolm and these young people have done through BLM, through the particular struggles of black people, because in a biblical sense, black people have been the least of these. And the youth culture now is so great that they've stopped the divisions within uh, 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 racial and ethnic groups, meaning that the divisions around uh, being trans, around being queer, around being non-able-bodied, around being women, they've pushed away from that and said, what if we centered the people who even our own communities who are Latinx, indigenous, Asian American, black have marginalized? And what if we push uh, to, towards a post patriarchal notions of masculinity and femininity and just non-conforming the whole deal. So they've been extraordinary. So even as they're being ridiculed, they're the new architects of democracy. That's the whole thing. They're the architects of a, of a, of a non-violent uh, movement for democracy that understands the issues are intersectional, but so is our identities. And I think COVID-19 has shown us that COVID-19 impacted all of us differently right? Depending on our geography, our race, our age, our able-bodiedness, the whole thing, right? So when people say, oh, that's identity politics, no, it's recognizing the differences of your situation, right? So for me to have equity with a billion dollars, a billionaire, means I need a billion dollars, right? The billionaire doesn't get any equity. And that's the difference between equity and equality. So it's, a, I think this youth culture is extraordinary. And we they they both follow uh, follow us and they're leading us at the same time. It's back and forth, and that's what that's what generations do. When you're older, if you have humility, you both um, follow those students and learn from them. But you also have some nuggets of wisdom um, um, to to impart too, based on experience, just based on experience. So it's really extraordinary. It's an extraordinary time that that we are all you know living and writing and working in. Somebody just <clears throat> noted in the chat box that that was a, a brilliant answer to the to the question of the two different moments. And I mean, to see what's going on now as an expression of radical black citizenship. I mean, that's a really brilliant way to see it. I think it's so good. And, and I think women, you know, women have been key here. Uh, feminism has been key here. Black queer feminism, because even as again, at America's worst, we ridicule uh, women and especially women of color, um, but black uh, yeah. feminism and intersectional work has yeah. argued that we could all be saved, right? We could all be saved if we, if we went uh, beyond 
uh, uh, patriarchal and, and the, rigid, the, the rigidity right. of how we think about scholarship, mm -hmm. how we think about biography, how we think about poetry, how we think about the arts, right? And we're starting to see that happen where we see all these different women and it's like, what? They were never geniuses except in 2020? No, they had all this stuff <laughs> and, and we had systems that were precluding us from accessing this stuff. They, they've always been around, right? Mm -hmm. And we, 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 they, they were always the Michelle Obamas and the Oprah Winfrey's and again, Amanda Gorman, right? And yes. there, there's that for Asian American Pacific Islanders, for Latinx, for queer, the whole kit and caboodle. And so the only people who, who are gonna be fearful are gonna be the people who benefited from this specific status quo, right? Because, because the resources haven't been allocated fairly, right? Th there hasn't been public justice. We have locked up over 2 million people, right? So that's what Dr. King, when he said a revolution of values and King becomes this heroic figure, not because of the Nobel prize and not because of Time Magazine and meetings with JFK and LBJ, it's when he does the exact opposite. That's when he becomes heroic. He's in Marks, Mississippi, the poorest zip code in the United States. And Dr. King, and we've got the footage, he's in tears when people are telling him that they can't afford shoes for their children and they can't afford food for, for their families. Dr. King's in tears and he tells them, we are going to march down to Washington, D.C. And this is Dr. King, not Malcolm X. He tells him the way you're living in Marks, Mississippi in 1968, he says it's a crime in the richest nation in the world. And we're going to march. He doesn't say we're going to be violent. He says we're going to sit in Washington, D.C. until this all changes. And he's assassinated before he can get to Washington, D.C. He's assassinated well, Thursday, <laughs> April 4th, 6 p.m. Memphis time before he can get to Washington, D.C. And they weren't cursing. There were no knives, no guns. They said, we're gonna sit. And we all have to sit in this shame of this kind of poverty in the richest nation in the world. And that was 53 years ago, right? So that's where King becomes this heroic figure. King becomes a heroic figure where he turns his back on a mainstream incremental notion of justice and says, we either all are, are gonna survive and flourish together or I'm gonna protest until that happens, right? There are well, no threats King, there. King, That's the King, in King in Washington uh, brings us to another question, which is apt here, I think. How would Malcolm X and Dr. King have differed in their reactions to President Obama's presidency and its policies? You know, I don't know if there would have been differences. I think that King, you know, King challenged Lyndon Johnson. I think King would have been proud that we had a black president. I think King would have criticized the drone, the drone wars and, and drones that have collateral damage uh, and kill innocents um, um, in the name of freedom. I think King would have been uh, very, very critical of uh, economic policies that allowed uh, folks who were part of the Great uh, Recession and the, the, the meltdown to escape uh, any kind of punishment, yet people who were very, very poor or uh, working class and middle class lost their homes. I think he would have pushed back against um, tax policies that were not fair and progressive. Uh, and certainly I think Malcolm would have pushed back on the president's um, Africa policies, pushed back on the policies towards the third world. He would have embraced the Cairo speech uh, in 2009, but then would have said that there wasn't enough follow through on that Cairo speech in 2009. So I think, I think that both of them, and this is where I think Malcolm and Martin are much more interesting historical figures than we give them credit for, is that they both learn from each other. Malcolm starts to see that you actually need citizenship and dignity. Our proof of this is not just the meeting between them, March 26, 1964, at the US Senate. It's the ballot or the bullet speech that Malcolm says. And then also, Malcolm uh, sees King uh, December 17th, 1964, give a, a speech in Harlem after winning the Nobel Prize. And Malcolm speaks about that speech a few days later, praises King. And then Malcolm, shortly before his death, tries to visit King in Selma, Alabama. And he speaks with Coretta Scott King. He tells her he admires her husband. He's there to help. And he wants people to see that Black people have to get the ballot. And what King do is doing is right. And he tells the press this right after. So you can see that Malcolm uh, starts to see that, look, if you want dignity, 
uh, you need democracy as well. Even though Malcolm's always skeptical of democratic institutions because he's skeptical of the ability of democracy to work in a way that is anti-racist because it's never worked in that way before. And we're still struggling right now as we speak, right? It's never worked that way before. When King, how King learns, King becomes a much more um, defiant uh, uh, and really even vociferous uh, figure. King becomes uh, this pillar of fire after Malcolm's assassination. King starts to openly speak about black pride and self-determination. King starts to become the most vocal critic against white supremacy after Malcolm X, uh, who had been the most vocal critic. King is saying that the halls of Congress are running wild with racism in 1967. Uh, in 1967, King says that the biggest threat to peace in the United States is white racism and that all Americans have unconscious racism and bias. This is Martin Luther King Jr., right? And he says in 67 that we, don't, we might not have the political maturity to do what needs to be done. Black and white soldiers are killing people in Vietnam and King says they can't live on the same block in Detroit. That's a sick society. And King says when they're criticizing King, he says, I'm the physician diagnosing us with the disease. I didn't call, cause this illness and cancer of racism. That's Dr. King. So King's a truly heroic figure when he really goes for broke, but yes, he always remains nonviolent but he's remaining nonviolent and becoming more revolutionary in the process. So we just stop and say he remains nonviolent. And we don't say that, look, he says that the, the, the urban rebellions were the language of the unheard and that the United States needed to focus on what were the root causes. People don't get angry and violent for nothing. You know, uh, it, you know it, there, there are root causes to all of this. And King challenged us. He implored us to say, what if we became this beloved community? What if we, we, we had a revolution of values where we moved away from materialism, militarism, and racism, and he said we could be the good Samaritan. And that's what he said he wanted to be. Everyone could be great because they could be service-oriented leaders. So mm -hmm. King calls us towards this aspirational leadership that at our best, at times, we actually approach. Uh, but at our worst, we not only fall short, we really betray our fundamental professed values. So that's where King becomes such a heroic figure, both in his time, but also uh, in our own. But we don't want to talk about the radical revolutionary King. We freeze frame him at the March on Washington because we, 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 we aren't necessarily scared of that King, even though that King talked about uh, reparations, that King talked about Stone Mountain, Georgia as the birthplace of the Klan, that King said Alabama, and Mississippi were states filled with vicious races. That king said we all had to struggle together and organize together, but he said we had to go to jail together, right? Reason he says we have to go to jail together on August 28th, 1963, you only have to go to jail if you're fighting for justice in an unjust society, everyone. <laughs> I want people to know, you don't, you don't go to jail in a just society when you're fighting to eliminate poverty. When you're fighting for voting rights, what, who, who would put somebody in jail for that, right? right. Here's, here's a comment from um, <clears throat> Eric Darnell Pritchard uh, about Ella Baker. He, he says that she seems to me to be a really good example of what it means to elder with youth activism. The way she was so nimble with leading and her wisdom, but also being led with humility in both cases. So do you want to say something a little bit more about Ella? Oh, Wait. no, absolutely. But Barbara Ransby has written a definitive biography, um, you know, Ella, Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Struggle. Um, you know, Ella Jo Baker, born in 1903 in North Carolina. She went to Shaw University. Uh, she's a Black radical feminist organizer. She was a labor organizer in the 1940s, NAACP organizer. Um, she becomes um, part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, um, uh, part of their executive board, and, and she uh, really impacts Dr. King's thinking in a lot of ways. You know, they, they butt heads. Uh, Ella Baker is a feminist. She feels that uh, Black male preachers have a kind of toxic masculinity. Uh, they're hogging the stage. They're getting too much credit. Um, and, and she believes that uh, King is part of top-down leadership. I think some of her criticism is valid against King. Some of it's actually not valid, and some of it becomes a, a, a personal deal. But she helps to organize the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee 
uh, Easter weekend, April 15th to the 17th at Shaw University. Uh, and she's the fo person who tells them that what they're fighting for is about more than just a hamburger. The sit-ins aren't about a hamburger, they're about democracy, right? And she's the person who tells them that strong people don't need strong leaders. And she's a big believer in what, you know, sociologists later call participatory democracy, but it's what the Black Lives Matter movement is doing, saying that we're going to be a loose network so that none of us can be killed or assassinated or discredited in a way that's going to undercut this movement, right? And you can see there are efforts right now to attack BLM founders and say that they are too rich, they've bought too many homes. So it's already started. And, and, and that's why I think Ella Baker is a, is a, is a huge example of what Eric is saying, that, that real kind of eldering wisdom and that real, that real strategy too, to say, look, we don't want top, just top-down leadership alone. You can have representatives, you can have spokespersons. And I think one of the, one of the most interesting parts of the, about the time we live in now, so many of the representatives have been black women. You know, um, they, They've always been organizing and active and intellectuals and leaders but a lot of times, like we saw at the March on Washington in 1963, they were purposely left out because so many black men were interpreting freedom as, as equating with uh, white patriarchal prerogatives. You were gonna be just like John Kennedy and treat women like John Kennedy. That's not anything to aspire to. And that's what, um, you know, what, 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 what Malcolm says, you don't want to burn, you don't want to integrate into a burning house, right? And it's not, it's not just, uh, I, I use President Kennedy as an example, as any president, President Kennedy, Johnson, or, or any, any, any uh, uh, leader of that time. So we're in a different time. And I think that that's both thrilling and exciting, but for some people, it's really scary. Uh, and that's why some people have pushed back hard against these notions of intersectionality, uh, both, both outside the Black community and within the community. I'm just thinking of Maxine Waters saying to Jordan, <laughs> shut your mouth. Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Maxine Waters is somebody who, who came early and stayed late. She's been, yes, around, she's been around for a long time. Long right. time, yeah. Right. LA in Rebellion 1992. And when she said, hey, people need uh, the politics of confrontation, uh, she's not alluding to violence. One of the things we've seen mm -hmm. is that Alongside of nonviolent protests, it's always been massive numbers of people in the streets that have, 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 have made any kind of change in this society. Um, would we have been talking about systemic racism in the United States if millions of people hadn't marched uh, in the streets in May, June, July, August, uh, September of last year? We would not. I was on national news a lot during that time and people just couldn't believe it. You know, By the first week of June, when these, these protests really crest, you were getting 80, 50, 100,000 people in cities all gathering. And again, 95% peacefully. And what were they saying? This will not stand. And what's so extraordinary about our time and the young people that Debbie was alluding to and that Eric was alluding to is um, you had such large numbers of young white people alongside Latinx. And look at, look at how we've made such a big stand against uh, Asian American Pacific Islander uh, hatred and racism, how we've pushed back against that to talk about coalitions, alliances. Uh, really, we've never had this kind of um, unity uh, that is multiracial, multicultural, multigenerational, uh, that, is, that is proudly queer, that is proudly uh, female. It, it's, we, we, are, we are in such bold historic times that politicians and our policies have not caught up to what's out there. And this is large numbers, right? This is it's not just the 81 million uh, who voted uh, for this current uh, president. This is large numbers. These are millions of people. We've never had a social movement for any specific issue in, in American history where 15 to 26 million people came out and said yes. Never in the history of the nation, right? So we know something big, big is happening right before our eyes. Let me just say, time for, sorry, go ahead, Ed. To, to agree with Peniel and to add um, about something, one way to think about the, 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 the healthy differences or the, the healthy um, state of affairs now versus some more challenging eras in the past. I think about um, the Derek Chauvin trial and, and, and all of this business we've been looking at after the massacre in Georgia uh, at the spas. 
And I'm thinking of in 1991, 92, when a Rodney King was beaten and then we were waiting a trial and all that. At the same time, there was incredible animosity and violence between black communities and Korean communities in, in LA and elsewhere in New York. And to think about you know the, the Rodney King era where the stance against police uh, violence against black people coexisted with this terrible, terrible uh, inter-ethnic almost warfare, uh, mm -hmm. but certainly conflict. And now to see them really going together with, with such great passion um, and, and smart organizing uh, is, is really a, a wonderful um, and very, very healthy and very powerful thing. I think we've got time for one last question. <clears throat> and this is a tough one, I think, really. Yeah. Uh, it's about reparations. Yes. Yeah. And it's posed by Elizabeth McCune. Do you think reparations are essential to overcoming white supremacy and reaching reconciliation in the US. How strongly did King and Malcolm X feel about the role of reparations? Yeah, no, I think they both supported reparations. I, I, I support reparations as well. I think um, there's a great new book by Sandy Darity, William Darity Jr. And, and Kirsten Mullen called From Here to Equality about reparations uh, for Black Americans in the 21st century. And I think that, you know, reparations are the only way you're going to close the wealth gap between Black and white families. So basically, this is not income. There's a huge, huge wealth gap. And, you know, it's something like it would take something like 16 trillion over 10 years uh, to, make, to make that happen. You'd close about 90% of the wealth and asset gap uh, on average. Um, so yeah, I, I think reparations is is really really important uh, in in many fundamental ways. I think one is the wealth gap. You know, I think that that is hugely hugely important. Uh, but there's reparations connected to farming and land and agriculture that was lost. You know, uh, black farmers at one point were 15 percent of of farmers in the country. They're less than two percent right now. Uh, the new uh, COVID stimulus bill provided about five billion dollars in basically sort, sort of some reparation payments for a group of farmers who had been denied loans, denied access, even after they filed a class action suit and thought they had won 20 years ago, turned out they hadn't. Um, so when we think about that idea of repair, it's gonna be across a number of lines. There's one, the economic reparations, uh, but two, there's gonna be very discrete reparations in this sense. There's uh, black uh, GIs who were never uh, provided access to the GI Bill, right? There are Black uh, folks who were never provided access to FHA, a 30-year uh, low-interest mortgages during the New Deal. So we have very concrete, in addition to sort of, uh, sort of racial slavery and land expropriation afterwards, there are very, very concrete reasons why. And even right now, McKinsey, the consulting firm, just released a report on uh, the black worker. And right now, if you, you can Google that report, McKinsey report, black worker, uh, it'll take 95 years for black workers in the private sector to reach uh, parity, uh, just 12%, 95 years at the rate they're being hired in the private sector. They're also the, the, the lowest paid in the private sector, and they uh, are also least likely to be uh, living in the top 10 fastest growing cities in the United States, cities like Austin, where I live, where the black population, we're losing our black population instead of gaining it, right? So this idea of repair. And then finally, when we think about repair, it's truth, uh, uh, justice, and reconciliation. If we acknowledge what needs to be done, if we do the policy changes uh, that, that have implement those policy changes with real impact, we can have um, that reconciliation that I think people long for, but too often they long for it on the cheap right? Just by saying, let's have a conversation with no a redistribution and reallocation of resources. And I think, you know, um, what we're doing here, biographers, uh, uh, you know, bio has done, uh, I, I think, a good job uh, with, with um, trying to respond and react to the moment, because there's been so much segregation uh, within fields, right? Including fields of biography, higher education, the arts, right? For all of us here, we're artists, right? L all of us here who, who write, who are, who are po poets, who are biographers, who are writers, who are speakers, we're, we're artists. There's been so much, uh, it's been so hard uh, for, for Black people and people of color uh, to get access to these things that, that we all have 
a kind of reparative work to do, you know? And I think last summer, what was so exciting, and we still have to hold people accountable, was really more often than not, people were saying, yes, I understand. Like people were seeing what was happening in the streets. They were talking to their children. You know, pe people were saying, what's going on? And they were saying, okay, I understand. And this was white people. And at times it was white people who were thought leaders, white people who are corporate leaders, who are political leaders, who are leaders in the arts. And I think that's really, really important. So I think when we think about reparations, we should think about it as this huge concentric circle where of course that center middle part is the federal government, is the federal government is the only force on the planet that would ever have the resources to provide reparations that are comparable to what needs to happen, right? But then all of us have a space outside of that center, right? It could be in your organization like bio, it could be at your school, it could be in your church, synagogue, mosque, it could be whatever collective or network you're a part of. And you think to yourself, how can we repair that breach that even if we haven't actively contributed to, we've passively allowed to grow, right? And that's why I think that when I, when I think about reparations, we all have a role way beyond uh, uh, voting and being civic activists, but wherever we're at, because everybody on this call has networks, has power, has privilege, all of us, we know it. You know, and we're, we can use that privilege to repair by reaching out. We can acknowledge what we, what we haven't done. And then we roll up our sleeves and say, how can we elevate? How can we, how can we help these voices? And I think that's what we're doing with the, with, with the, with the scholarship, uh, the fellowship for, for, for Black biographers. There, there's so much other things that we all can do. Uh, and we don't have to wait for the president of the United States. You know what I mean? Like that's, you know, like, He's got his job. We don't have to wait for the vice president to do it. She has her job, right? We have our jobs, right? We're always telling that to our children. Don't wait, be proactive, right? We need to be the example that we try to teach our children uh, in terms of building this beloved community. So yes, reparations, we want truth, justice, and reconciliation, but we can't get to either part without doing the first, the truth, right? <laughs> then the justice, and then the reconciliation. So I want the kumbaya moment with with everyone as well. I do, I do. I remember the old Coca-Cola commercial, uh, Deirdre, where it's like, I'd like to buy the world of Coke from 1969, <laughs> 70. And we were all gonna, you know, it was sort of Earth Day. It was like this place where there was no racism, there was no class problem. Oh, I remember that, it was wonderful. We just, yeah. we just gave each other that Coca-Cola, right? <laughs> <And> just, <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> Instead, we got Emory University. <laughs> well, it's good. <laughs> it's lovely that we can conclude this um, really inspiring and thoughtful and thought-provoking exchange. It's been terrific. And it, it's wonderful we can end it on a kumbaya moment. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. Thank you, everyone who was connect. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much, my friend, Ed Pavlich, who's uh, everybody should, he's got a new book on um, Adrian Rich coming Adrian out. Adrian Rich, and, yes. And he's, he's uh, one of the most prolific, prodigious scholars in the United States. And um, he's done terrific work on James Baldwin. Uh, he's written a novel as well. So this is somebody whose work uh, should be celebrated and, and check, checked out uh, in a big way. So it's always a, a pleasure to um, have conversations with you. Definitely. It thank thank you very thank much, you. Fidel and Ed. This, this is a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, very much. And thank you again, Pranil. Thank, thank you. you so much. Goodbye. Bye. Peace. Bye. <laughs>